The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives, so don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew Meredith from Mortal Partners, welcome back to the show, mate. Thanks, mate. Good to see you again. As always, a pleasure. Today, we're talking about um, technology companies. We're just going to quickly open with that and why the end may not be over, like may not, may not be the end of tech stocks. And then we're going to talk about uh, four ideas to get people started, to put on your watch list. If you're thinking of ideas to capitalize on uh, in, a, in a downturn and you don't know where to start your research, this is um, where you can do that. Uh, we're going to share two ideas each. We've got one ETF that we're going to share each, and then we've got two companies that we're going to talk through as well. Um, might, I might just start off with, mate, um, we just talked about off-air, a hold on for dear life is, is the typical thing that you see <laughs> getting uh, bandied around. Um, do you think people have the, I guess, stomach for volatility that we're seeing at the moment? We're about to find out, aren't we? You know, yeah. Bitcoin's down, what, 40, 50%. Yep. Uh, some of the most po- profitable, you know, popular tech companies are down 40 to 50% from their highs as well. Uh, we know that, you know, hold on for dear life, means compounding and compounding is the most powerful thing you have when you're investing. Uh, but emotion, you know, the entire system is set up against us <laughs> holding on. Yes. Yeah. Don't, don't read the, uh, if you read the paper on the weekend, there is enough reasons to sell on Monday. And I probably got mm. a few calls about that. So um, I <laughs> yeah, think that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a thing, right? Like now is the time for compounding to, for you to let yourself compound. If you, if you're worried about everything in your portfolio and you sell out, um, what does Charlie Munger say? Compounding is the most powerful force. Don't interrupt it or something like that. So, you know, this is the time where we want to keep our, our eyes fixed to the horizon, um, avoid getting kind of shaken around a bit and just focus on really good investments, really sensible investments and build that portfolio uh, from the ground up if you haven't already. How about in terms of tech stocks in particular, they've been smacked. Um, 
some companies, like you said, down 50%, 60%. Is this the end of technology companies? Should we be selling all of our tech and moving into, I don't know, energy or utilities? Like what's going on? Maybe it's the end of price to sales as a valuation tool for <laughs> technology. <laughs> I know Fortescue just did just announced their new acquisition on a price to sales basis, but you know, it's <laughs> a lot of the a lot of our companies would be worth a lot more if we just <laughs> sold them on sales, not profit. Um, I think, yeah, I don't think there's any end to it. Technology has, you know, is barely you look around, it's barely scratching the surface in terms of its in you know importance to the economy you know we saw a huge digitization or dig- digitalization last year and the year before but that was barely it's still barely beginning um i don't think you're going to see you there's such strong performance over such a short period of time um but you're probably going to see some of the sales growth dip down from a 30 a quarter to eight or ten you know any company that's growing at eight or ten percent to me is still a pretty quality company yeah, I saw, um, so as you would know, Vanguard and all the big investment firms, they do their 10-year outlook statements at the end slash beginning of the year. And what they've said from high, highly valued tech stocks is their, their simulation, which runs 10,000 different, you know, it's 10,000 different simulations rolled into one number. Um, they think for high, highly priced tech stocks, the average annualized return could be close to 0.8% per year. Um, whereas a kind of more balanced portfolio of equities could be more like five to 6% per year. And so if you think about that, if you think about the growth rates that you would need to achieve, like that's just a forecast. It's not a guarantee or anything, but if, if you think about that, the hurdle for achieving the market return or doing pretty well from your investing is actually not as high as you might've thought it was. The Australian ASX 200 has done about 10 or 11% for the past 10 years in total return terms, with a lot of that being made up by dividends. So I guess this is all to say that if you invest sensibly throughout the market cycle, you don't need to shoot the lights out with growth. You should be fine. You know, you, over the next 10 years, you're going to be okay. Just invest sensibly and keep your eyes fixed to the horizon. So maybe we can, maybe we can jump off now into some ideas. The first one that I might draw attention to is an ETF um, the Qual ETF, it trades on the ASX under the ticket code QUAL. And this is the, the Van Eck uh, MISCI, MSCI, International Quality ETF. And it includes a couple hundred, about 300 uh, individual shares. And I guess the it says it really on the tin what it does. And that is it, it identifies companies with low financial leverage, earning stability, meaning profits are pretty stable. And the companies are, tend to be higher quality and they measure that through a factor of return on equity. So if we combine high return on equity, stable earnings, and low debt, um, what we come out with is 300 companies that um, are kind of resilient and aren't in that really precarious position of being um, caught up with, you know, stuck with debt, stuck with interest payments if, in, if interest rates rise, um, if they're earning respectable returns on equity um, over time, then you end up with, a franchise that should be pretty resilient. And I think resilience is the key focus when, in, when inflation rises. And so, I mean, sorry, I'll, I'll throw it over to you and then I can keep rambling. I was going to say, and quality has been one of the best performing factors over the last, you know, investment factors over the last five or 10 years. Yeah, that's right. And so what Drew's saying is effectively, like if we can measure quality and we typically rate that through things like return on equity, return on capital, um, if we can measure that statistically, that tends to do pretty well. Um, value for a long time struggled. Um, that's the you know low price to book, low price to sales, all that sort of stuff because money was flowing into the high growth momentum type stocks. Um, now we're, we're we're kind of seeing a, a more balanced view of the factors, and Qual seems to be at least on the ASX. It seems to be one of the the best ETFs for this type of exposure. If you want global stocks. Inside the ETF at the moment, I think there's about $2.8 billion of, of, in, of invested money. Um, so you get about 300 shares. It's a diversified portfolio. If I just rattle off some of the names at the top of this list, it's not going to seem like um, it is really diversified because the biggest companies are obviously at the top because it's a market-weighted, um, I guess, universe. But we've got Apple, Microsoft, Meta, slash Facebook, NVIDIA, Alphabet, but if, the, if you go further down, that's when you start to see more diversity in the names. So then you start to see United Health, you see uh, ASML Holdings, uh, and you see a bunch of different companies that aren't just pure tech companies. Um, 
I and the big one there is you see everyone will go, oh, it's the S&P, but yeah, Apple and Microsoft are there, but Tesla's not, you know, yeah. Twitter's not. Uh, what was I going to say? Another one, Amazon's not. So the companies that aren't that aren't growing earnings or the companies that are, aren't as high quality, they're not there. It does Part of it does look similar, but... Yeah, yeah, if you drop outside the top 10, let's look at some other names. You've got Nestle, you've got Roach, you've got Cisco, um, you've got Costco, Coca-Cola, uh, Merck, Nike, you know, heaps of different names of businesses that are still really high quality, really good franchises that aren't in that diehard tech space. So we're avoiding that real frothiness at the top and we're replacing that with resilient businesses that are decades old in most cases. So um, I think for an ETF, um, to position this ETF in a portfolio, I think it's more of one of those core holdings you could have. Um, you don't want to be necessarily trading anything like this, but it's um, it's it's a reasonably priced ETF, long-term focused, you know, focus on quality companies. If you're looking for exposure to that quality factor, I think this is a pretty good way to go about it. So that's my number of, one. And a lot of people have talked about that, that I met with him, maybe it's older people, you know, being concerned about buying overseas equities. But, you know, Apple's what a two trillion dollar market cap. If you mm. if you think size gives you quality size gives you, you know, less risk, well, you want some Apple. So these are good ways to do it. A bit, you know, a bit more unique. Um, and it also lets you, you know, if you're at a value investor in at heart and you've got all mining and financials in your portfolio, well, here's an easy way to get global quality and You'd, you'd know almost every company in that portfolio. That's it, yeah. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's a good one for the watch list. So that's Qual, Q-U-A-L, it's on the ASX. Mate, I might throw it over to you for a company, which is a, a similar but different company, uh, ETF, sorry. Yeah, this one's a bit outside the box and, uh, you know, probably uh, random timing, going tech. <laughs> we had the worst <laughs> sell-off in probably close to five or six years. Uh, we'll see in so six I, months. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what, what we do when we're using these things, we we want to, within a diversified portfolio, you want something that provides you something, any an exposure that's different. You know, if I want S&P, I can get that anywhere and you get it for eight base points. If you want to, if you want big tech, well, that's easier by fangs. Um, so I've, I looked at the ETF securities Morningstar Global Tech. So Morningstar is a research house we use uh, at Waddle provides research, you know, stock research, fund research. Uh, and this is basically to technology, invest in technology companies all over the world, but splits it um, not as market cap driven. I'm not sure if it deliberate, if it excludes fangs, Microsoft is in the top 10, but basically the majority of the big names barely exist in there. Uh, and that way it offers you a bit more diversification away from, you know, the names that dominate markets everywhere else so i looked in there sectors are split a bit more broadly you've got some software you've got semiconductors you've got electronics so different part of that tech supply chain just not the front end applications um, that everyone tends to focus on and the portfolio looks super unique I, i've held palo alto networks myself so like a cyber security business microsoft's in there like i said F5, you've got a few service providers to data centers. So, and, you know, all these, I don't know what, what any of them do, but, you know, connectivity between, yeah, you know, the cloud isn't just the cloud, but there's all kinds of things that go connecting the cloud and making the cloud work for different businesses. Um, so expands that entire spectrum of, of technology, which I've found, mm -hmm. you know, we've done analysis. We do, I think we're going through how to, how to analyze the fund manager and the kind of overlap of holdings in this versus some of the active global equity strategies, there's little, if any, and that's why we, we've seen some value in it. Yeah. And so, the, yeah, it's even companies like Tyler Technologies and, and Blackboard, which are more diversified software companies. Um, and so these are really unique names in, in the list. So if you're used to owning FANG stocks or used to owning, you know, the very popular consumer facing tech, uh, this is definitely a way to diversify away from that while also having the kind of essence of what you're trying to do. I think we spoke off air about why this ETF is unique also in the ETF space being that it, because it's powered by that Morningstar research, it actually has um, the ability to still get the competitively advantaged businesses like say the Moat ETF or the GOAT ETF but what it does differently is it's targeting this that kind of the diversified technology stack and it's in global markets. So it's every market developed. Um, so what you get is still that global exposure, competitively advantaged businesses that are reasonably priced, but you're looking outside the usual names. And so 
from a you know in a in a portfolio perspective this this is like you said very little overlap but it still gets captures the essence or the expression of what most people want from a portfolio where would you position this in a client portfolio would this be more core or like a longer term holding or would this be more tactical be a yeah. tactical thematic. Yeah. So about yeah, 36 holdings, market caps, average market caps or medians 40 billion, whereas you know the median of the S&P is like 150 billion. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's quite different. You know, 25% of that. Uh, we'd say, you know, you'd have your core, um, and this would probably fall in your small to mid cap allocation or a dedicated tech exposure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is um some we've got two really interesting names here. We've got Qual, which is going to give you exposure outside of um, just tech, and we've got tech, which is obviously focused on tech. So, um, complementary ETFs in that sense. Now, if we can shift gears, people love to hear us talk about companies. I might save yours for last because <laughs> yours is the one that will probably raise a few eyebrows, and it's also um, just very topical, even if you're not invested in the company. But the one that I'm going to talk about is a small cap company. It's about 180 million dollars market cap as of the recording, which is 25 June 2022. Uh, it's a company called SmartPay Holdings, trades on the ASX under the ticket code SMP. What SmartPay does is it seems very similar to most other payments companies. I think if you look at the gig sectors and most data providers' websites, they say it's a software and technology company and that's about it. But actually what it does is it actually provides payment terminals for, um, for stores. But and not so buy you, now, pay later. No, buy now, pay later, no nothing like that, no fanciness. It is really just we put the, 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 the terminal, like that FPOS terminal that you see, it plugs in with your point of sale um, and it's typically focused on not the micro sized businesses. So not the things that you'd get like a, you know, like, um, like a van or a, you know, a mobile business. You're seeing this um, in the established businesses like uh, retail or even in uh, businesses that are, you know, fast food and, and casual dining and those types of things. And the reason why smart pay is a bit different is smart pays bread and butter, unlike say Tyro or, or square is actually the ability to use something called smart charge. The smart charge, what it does is it passes the cost of the transaction, so that 0.3% um, back onto the cu- customer. So uh, if you go and get your tacos and your, your, your bottle of Coke for lunch, you might see on your receipt that it says you know, $20 plus you know, 75 cents or 60 cents. And so smart pay automatically calculates what Visa or MasterCard are going to charge and auto- automatically calculates all that for the merchant or for the store and passes that back to you. And this is fully disclosed to you. And you might think that this is actually something that puts you off, it, you know, puts people off, oh, why would I would have to pay for this? But from the merchant or the retailer's perspective, this is actually brilliant because what it does is it actually means that you can take card payments and you're not incurring that pretty hefty cost. As you and I know, Many of these retail businesses or cafes or whatever, their profit margins might only be single digits. So to get back 1% is actually a big deal. And it also means reconciliation is easy. So it's a, it's a really interesting small business. It's got heaps of insider ownership, which I love. Um, and I was talking to the team, the RAS team about this just before I came on air and um, just making sure that they were comfortable for me to talk about this business. It is small cap. Um, so keep that in mind. It is volatile. Um, it is also New, a business. New Zealand listed? It's on the ASX. So yeah, it, it's New from New Zealand. So there's basically two parts of the business. The one part of their business in New Zealand is like a, a rentals business for payment terminals. So if you're a, a cafe owner over there, you might use smart pay, but you're not using the smart charge. Um, the difference is over there, you just pay a flat fee every month. Here in Australia, because smart pay has an acquiring license, so it can effectively act as the merchant's bank and, and take payments. It can, it can collect the percentage fee here. So it's a different model. So once the business is up and running, here in Australia, the gross margins and the ability to earn more is tremendous versus in the, uh, in the New Zealand business where it's capped and they've kind of reached maturity there. And the reason that they can't do what they do there, uh, what they do here over there is because the payments system is different over there. Whereas here it's fragmented and you just need the acquiring license to get in. And we're seeing um, smart pay grow really fast. Um, there are risks in the short term, like the pandemic shutting down businesses, but a lot of the terminals are back online. The way I think about smart pay is um, it's basically a land and expand model. Once they put the terminal in, that's probably the hardest part. Then it just 
starts to collect revenue over time. And we're seeing the value of the terminals go up. And what I mean by that is as the, the cohort has matured, more terminals are reaching that mature phase, which means more revenue is coming in the door from existing cohorts. And um, the big risk here, Drew, is just that Square, which is obviously everywhere in Australia now, um, Square and Tyro and even the big banks, like through Commonwealth Bank, get more innovative with their models. Yeah. Um, and that's that's just is what it is. We've seen, we've got another kind of risk in the background, which is the FPOS network with the Beamit terminals. Um, and effectively, they can instantly transfer money between the, the store and you as a consumer for no cost. And you can use the Beamit app to wire money around. So it kind of makes sense. But we haven't seen the consumer uptake of that to the point where it would severely impact my view of smart pay or Tyro. Um, my value as well. Yeah, it would take a while. We'd have pretty good visibility in that. My, yeah, my evaluation of um, smart pay gives me a lot of confidence that uh, even in a volatile environment, we're not paying overs for this business, um, even though it's growing pretty fast. So don't look at the market today. I just opened uh, um, Comsec while we're sitting here. They didn't like the inflation figures, so <laughs> no. Okay, so well, let's let's just forget about that and focus on businesses. Speaking of businesses and one that's been sold down, I know yours is a bit of a prickly one. Um, so tell us a little bit about which company you've gone with today, mate. Yeah, we probably had one loser in our portfolio over the last twelve months, and it lost badly. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, Magellan Financial Group probably one of, if not the worst performing stock on the ASX to uh, in the, if it's still in the 200 <laughs> in the last 12 months. 3.4 billion market cap now. Yeah. So it's it probably still in there. Yeah. Uh, pretty simple business. Everyone knows Hamish Douglas. I think you've interviewed him a few times. Yeah. Um, incredibly smart, you know, investor runs essentially created global equity investing in Australia and made it, made it possible for, fund manage for investors for institutions manage yep. managed over a hundred billion in in assets and very simple you charge a fee on that hundred billion and ninety percent of it gets paid out as a dividend every year a little bit gets you know the uh, the biggest cost is labor and marketing uh, when you're you know you like Australia's mm-hmm. Warren Buffett I don't think your marketing costs too much anymore um, everyone just dials in and listens to you they've just had a you know a shocking run essentially the performance of that business of the earnings anyway is driven by the performance of the, the funds whilst the <clears throat> management fees consist, you know, the core management fees being pretty consistent, the performance fees disappeared in the last few years. And that's because he got the market wrong. So when everyone, when the vaccines hit, he didn't, he didn't, he was conservative, as he said, he, and he's come out and said this, he's conservative. He didn't flip to all the cyclical travel, all these stocks that, that won and which dominated the index. So he underperformed, uh, the his benchmark by something like twenty percent over twelve months, and that twenty percent sent his ten year outperformance to basically zero. Yeah. So ten years of outperformance gone in a twelve month period. Um, I think, and that's that's just you talk a lot about the performance, but ultimately that performance is going to drive what the share price does for better or worse. Mm-hmm. He's still they lost a major contract, so St James Park, which is like a huge financial planning group in. UK, they pulled about 16 billion and put it into indexing set effectively strategies out of um, Magellan. Uh, so they're losing some assets, but the share price has fallen significantly more. So some of the analysts are saying at its current price, it would have to lose over half of its assets under management and cut its fees by 40% hmm. to, you know, to warrant the current valuation. So if you think that they're not going to lose another 50 billion and they're not going to cut their fees mm. that much, they probably will a little bit, well, it should be a discount. But mm. <laughs> early, uh, personally, I think it is, you know, he's proven, I mean, he's been quite correct on a number of things, but obviously made some poor investment calls throughout that. One of the biggest drags, you look at his at the performance and it was staying overweight to something like Alibaba. Um, you know, pretty much every global fund manager was invested in Alibaba ahead of the Ant IPO. Uh, most of them sold out once it hit. He didn't. And that, you know, that thing's fallen 50% in 18 months and been a big drag. Um, mm. I think in a world where it's hard, to, maybe not today, but when, it, when it's hard to find things that are truly cheap, it looks like 
it's cheap, but I've said that before. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you've got some pushback on that. Well, I, so this is something that's always been interesting to me, right? Because if I'm just looking at the raw numbers here, I see a price earnings ratio of 12, which is something 12 months ago, you would have seen that and you would be like, this is, this is a business going bankrupt. <laughs> and so I think there are a few things that are really telling about Magellan. One, the actual franchise. So if you're looking at fund managers, the actual franchise is incredibly strong. Um, and here in Australia, it, it, there's nothing that I would say comes close to it yet. There are some funds emerging in the background in that kind of, five to $15 billion range of um, assets under management that are now starting to look at retail and intermediaries and thinking, okay, well, maybe we can take some of Magellan's pie here. I guess the key risk for everyone is what's to stop Magellan being a platinum from an investment perspective. You know, platinum asset management is also listed yeah, and it's looked cheap for quite some time. And they got a call wrong when they were Asian equities um, when they should have been U.S. equities, that was quite a few years ago now. But like, how do we? How does it? How does Magellan stop that? Yeah, that's the uh, the big question, isn't it? I mean, you've you've kind of seen adjustments in recent quarters, and you know, I think the worst thing you could possibly do do now is if you've always been conservative, why go out and you know go back to the index or why go take risk again? That's how you lose assets under management. Assets, it's all an asset game, you know. Funds mm-hmm. under management, uh, platinums, despite underperformance, their their outflows slowed, and they've still got about the same as they had, I think, five or six years ago. Um, so, and I think people are, are sticky. Yes, you, you're not talking about a fund that dropped thirty percent. You're talking about a fund that went up ten, versus an index that did thirty. Um, he, I mean, he'll keep stressing, which is sounds like it's on you know close to his, but his downside capture is significantly less than the index. So. Um, I think the the only way it recovers you stick to stick to your knitting, be as present as possible, and um, you know you've made a, a a living and a build a self made business over fifteen years by doing one thing well, and yeah, you can't do more than that. Mm. Um, and that's the I think that's how you stem the outflows. I think naturally people don't want to move. You know the amount of work that goes into moving a managed fund or trading things. Um, so it can be stickier than you think. I think there's they've been quite innovative in their products. So I think the Magellan products are the largest ETFs in the market, even though all the other ones have been getting all the attention. Well, Magellan's global fund is still the biggest that you can get. Um, and then mm. obviously made a few investments into Guzman y Gomez, which people didn't like, <laughs> mm. and owning the Baron Joey Investment Bank, uh, which is like the second, third in the leaderboard for most M&A over the last few years too. So, mm. I think, yeah, it's, and that's the, I think we look at the global fund, like you said, I think you rightly pointed out that the global fund being the gorilla of their funds is the fund that d- dictates share price performance. So the performance yeah. of the fund determines the sentiment amongst the investors because it's not earning performance fees and so on and so forth. But they also have early funds management, which they acquired not too long ago, which, yeah. which has some great investors inside of it. They've got the core series. They've got the retirement income products. They've got the principal investments, like those capital investments into um, funds themselves. So I think one thing that is probably worth pointing out is probably the key man risk and or key person risk, I should say. Um, they're trying, I know that they're trying to diversify. This isn't just the Hamish show, whereas in the past that was okay. Maybe yeah. now, maybe like now they Buffett, need to get yeah. away. Yeah, and it's not necessarily that, Hamish is not a great investor. We all know that he's a great investor. It's just more so that to, to, to kind of reassure investors that there is, you know, 37 analysts at Magellan and all of them are very good. Um, you know, just yeah, yeah, key person cost. risk is a risk at every, every, every fund manager, particularly in Australia. Um, yeah. And yeah, exhibiting that debt, I got to invite to a webinar today that had three of their analysts, exactly what you're saying. They got analysts dedicated to different markets and different sectors within different markets. So they're doing a webinar with three analysts that aren't Hamish. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, stressing that. Mm. I think is yeah. a big one. Yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting company that we watch play out over the next year because the business model of funds management is brilliant. Um, it can work against you, which may be what we're seeing now. But that business model then lends itself to really high rates of free cash flow, which can be reinvested elsewhere. All paid back as fully frank dividends if it's an Australian company, which it is. 
So you end up in a position where you could make a lot of money um, or, you know, there, there's asymmetry too on the downside. But if they write the ship, then it's going to be a really interesting business over the next 12 to 24 months for investors. So uh, if, you, if you're looking to scrape your, you know, to get your value investing um, cap on and, and scrape those financials and have a look at what you think is going to happen to that thumb. Um, it's a really interesting business right now. Yeah. Um, you can see the media at the moment. So as soon as that Netflix news came out, um, their Netflix is a holding in their fund. So <laughs> referred oh, yeah. directly back to Magellan. So it very much will matter what the portfolio does yep. for the share price. Yeah. And, uh, and, but we know that, you know, typically, Sometimes it, it can be very difficult to be to know if you're right or if you're early in an investment. So a few weeks ago, I was saying how this is probably looking starting to look interesting. I didn't take any action on it, and I'm not necessarily taking any action. If you're the type of investor that is more conservative, you might wait for the ship to steady before you come back into it. But I just think there aren't that many high quality franchises that are founder led uh, in Australia. Um, so. Very interesting in any, in any case. Um, mate, that, that takes us through the four ideas. So, so just to recap, we had uh, the Qual ETF, ASXQUIL, which has like a more of like a, a differentiated approach to investing in global equities by focusing on more of the things that you would probably want in a, in a portfolio during an inflationary environment. Um, the tech ETF, which is developed markets, um, focuses on those moti businesses, but it's not necessarily you know, big tech, it's diversified tech, which is a really interesting tactical play right now. Uh, Smart Pay Holdings, which trades on the ticket code, uh, ASX SMP. Um, it's a payments terminals business that's still growing very fast. It basically has two sides of business of the business. So there's two companies within one company. One of it's growing very fast. The other one is very stable. Um, and you obviously brought up Magellan, which is on the ASX under the ticket code ASX MFG. And that's the investment company, not the fund that's listed on the ASX. We're talking about the, um, the actual uh, company itself that runs the funds. So um, always a good chat, mate. People can find out more about what you're doing at Waddle Partners and the financial planning that you provide um, by emailing you. I'll have your, the link in the show notes. Um, you can also head to waddlepartners.com.au. Drew Meredith, CFP, um, thanks for joining me on the show, mate. Thanks. And don't ask me too much about Magellan on the email. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always a pleasure, mate. Thanks for, thanks for your time. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.